Welcome to Starbase in 2025. A new year is upon us and with Booster 14 at the pad, we're seemingly just days away from Starship Flight 7. Speaking of which, SpaceX dropped a huge update about this upcoming flight. Payload, test objectives, airspace restrictions, you know what, let's just get into it. As always, before we dive into discussing the flight stack, let's make sure we give the proper attention to all the infrastructure so we don't miss any interesting developments around Boca Chica. The Chopsticks installation kit is still being prepared over at Tower 2, with ground preparations ongoing in the background. Once preparations begin to move and lift the sticks at the Sanchez lot, it will be a clear sign that the installation of the newer, shorter sticks is imminent. These new sticks are shorter than those currently installed on Tower 1 and are similar in size to the ones at the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. However, it doesn't look like these chopsticks are ready to be rolled out just yet, as they are still encapsulated in their work frame. The first item to leave, or at least be installed, will be the chopstick carriage. The carriage system attaches to the tower, allowing the chopsticks to move up and down. Next to the chopstick carriage, SpaceX appears to be preparing a hippo or subcooler, which is used during the propellant loading of the vehicle. It is unclear whether this will be a part of the second pad's infrastructure or if it will replace some components in the existing tank farm. It's fascinating to see the amount of hardware used to connect these pipes to the main structure. The numerous bolts ensure that everything is securely fastened, preventing leaks or unwanted movement. This level of precision and redundancy highlights the meticulous engineering required to handle the immense pressures and temperatures involved in rocket propellant systems. This, on the other hand, may not be the most thrilling part of the process, but watching the roof installation on the Drawworks building at the base of Tower 2 in a time lapse is certainly satisfying. Given the past damage to the Drawworks on Tower 1 from launches, it's reassuring to see Tower 2s getting reinforced. This attention to structural integrity is crucial for withstanding the intense forces during launches and ensuring the longevity of the structure. At the construction site for Pad B's launch mound, we observed a containerized cryogenic pipe assembly being transported with a forklift. The big question is whether this cryo installation is a major component of Pad B's plumbing system or if it's a smaller piece of hardware being added as part of the broader pad construction. This distinction is important as it will help clarify whether the focus is on the main cryogenic infrastructure or on supporting elements that contribute to the pad's overall functionality. On the mount itself, massive steel bars are being positioned to aid in the installation of the water-cooled deck. These bars serve as both weights and possibly jigs to assist in aligning and securing the main water-cooled segments. The platform, with its impressive heft, is nearing readiness. It will certainly be fascinating to watch it being transported down Highway 4 and installed at Pad B. Before we shift focus to other vehicles, let's take a look at an upcoming booster, Booster 15. This is the first stage slated for the eighth flight of Starship. Here you can see it disconnecting from the Mega Bay bridge crane after being moved back inside of Mega Bay 1. Over the Christmas period, Booster 15 underwent cryogenic proof testing at the Massey's outpost. It still lacks its grid fins, a hot staging ring and engines, but these are likely next on the list. Booster 15 will need to be ready for action as soon as the next flight, unless Booster 14 is reused, which, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they did reuse Booster 14, but doing so straight away does seem a bit tight. Taking a look into the Star Factory, the nose cone for Ship 36 is making significant progress, with the heat shield at the tip of the vehicle nearly complete. Recently, some cleaning or gluing work seems to have been done, as the tiles at the tip are noticeably shinier than the others. This is a sign that the final touches are being applied before further assembly or integration steps. As we move down the production line, we can see progress being made on the nose cones for ships 37 through 39, which are now resting besides the first nose cone. As these cones continue through the manufacturing process, they are moved to the next station for further assembly. Once completed, the final nose cone is rolled out for stacking with its corresponding payload section, and then it will be integrated with the rest of the ship. Right then, let's talk about the infrastructure needed for a Starship launch in the next week, starting with the orbital launch mount and its immediate surrounding area. Before any vehicles arrived at the pad, work on the mount remained relatively calm. One of the big tasks that needed to be sorted before flight is the removal of the scaffolding, but we've seen that done in a matter of hours in the past, so it's not something anyone will lose sleep over. Besides that, the OLM looks well refurbished, partially painted and ready to support a launch. The chopsticks are a big focus of the upcoming flight, with SpaceX once again going for a catch of the booster should conditions allow, so seeing the chopsticks just resting there without getting much attention is certainly a good sign. 
There will be a series of final inspections in the coming days, as SpaceX tends to do before a Starship flight, but things are looking good for the time being. Sure enough, as predicted, inspections and some work were carried out on the chopsticks on the last day of the year, with a group of workers seen on top of them. The reinforced booster quick disconnect cover also stands ready for the return of a booster to the pad. The BQD actually saw quite a lot of work over the past few weeks and months, as SpaceX didn't seem too happy with the amount of protection it offered the delicate quick disconnect hardware. In the past, we've seen various GSE pipes replaced on the QD, so let's hope SpaceX has sorted out the issue. Just before we move on to the Flight 7 stack, we wanted to show you something very cool about the future of the Starship program. NSF's Gary Blair does regular flyovers of the SpaceX test site at McGregor, Texas, and this time he spotted something really amazing, a Raptor 3 engine on the test stand with the serial number 4. It's brilliant to see SpaceX moving into testing as Raptor 3 is expected to be powering this Starship program in just a few months' time, although this could also be more gradual progress than some might have assumed. Regardless, a big thanks to Gary for the regular McGregor flyovers. The big ticket item for this week is, who would have thought, the readiness of the Flight 7 stack, since SpaceX apparently wants to fly either this week or the next. So let's take a look at these items, starting with Booster 14. Here you can see the massive booster, leaving its home at the production site to Mega Bay 1 in preparation for the transport to the launch site. Before the rollout was conducted, SpaceX rotated all four grid fins on the booster. This is always done before moving a booster out of the mega bay. It's most likely to A, test them, and B, spot them more easily from the ground so that they don't damage the booster and or the bay. The way they're rotated makes it easier to see if they're close to making contact with the walls of the mega bay during rollout if you imagine looking at them from the ground. Rotating them shows a solid surface rather than the gridded surface. There are other measures SpaceX takes to ensure the transport is safe. One of them is the installation of a system that keeps the booster pressurized during transport. Here you can see stops being hooked up to the booster before it is moved. This makes sure the booster stays stable during the journey and doesn't collapse as it's made of relatively thin steel. It's like a closed soda can versus an open one. Keeping it sealed and pressurized helps to keep it stable. This booster has 33 Raptor engines, which were all checked and verified during the booster's static fire not too long ago. But there's a surprise about one of those engines, so stay tuned for that. Booster 14 rolled to the pad just before the year came to an end on December 30th. There were some guesses that SpaceX might try go for a full stack to celebrate New Year's, but uh, that didn't happen. As the booster arrived at the pad, we could already see the chopsticks in the background moving into their operating position in preparation for the lift. Just like with the previous stack, SpaceX is optimizing the flow, and with that comes fewer and fewer lifts. The first lift was, in case you forgot, in preparation for the static fire. And speaking of optimizing the flow, you can see that the hot staging ring is already integrated on top of Booster 14, which makes sense given the indication that this is the only remaining lift of the booster. It's important to point out, especially to those of you who follow the program a bit more loosely, that this booster is not a Block 2 booster, unlike the ship. This booster is still a Block 1 booster, although it most likely features a number of hardware and software updates. The booster was then placed between the chopsticks in preparation to be lifted onto its spot on the orbital launch mount. Said lift came shortly after, even though South Texas was doing its Vandenberg impression. You can see the booster quick disconnect opening here as the hardware gets ready to deploy and connect to the booster. This is the moment when the booster can be pressurized on top of the pad, and it marks the end of the most intense part of any lift. This happened a few hours after the initial placement of the booster had finished. Remember that scaffolding we talked about earlier that can be removed quickly? Well, here it is, being removed quickly. It was taken down in no time and transported away. And just like that, it looks like the booster is ready to fly the seventh flight of Starship, resting on the OLM and just waiting for its partner, Ship 33, to be ready to fly. The ship, being the main star of the show, however, is taking a bit more time before it arrives on stage. SpaceX, meanwhile, performed another grid fin test on Booster 14. As you can see, the four grid fins here move and wiggle while the rocket is on the pad. One of the main things the grid fins can do is steer and provide roll control during the aerodynamic descent of the flight, and you can see them here almost going through certain maneuvers and configurations that SpaceX is testing, such as angling them in a way that would provide roll in one direction or the other. One of the final big steps before any vehicle is fully ready for flight is the installation of the flight termination system on the rocket. The last flight, SpaceX almost sneaked past everybody as they did it late at night. This time, however, we were prepared to spot it. It's difficult to spot because SpaceX did use a foggy night to conduct the work, but the lift you see going up the booster here is at the FTS box, and they're most likely installing the charges and pulling the arming pins for the booster. 
In case you're unaware and you're new to Starship, the FTS, that's the Flight Termination System, does exactly what it says on the tin. It's an explosive charge that can terminate the flight by damaging the booster's structure in a way that results in it blowing up. It's SpaceX's safety line of defense if anything goes wrong. If you needed more proof that this booster won't be leaving the OLM without Raptor propulsion, here it is, the removal of the orbital launch mount alignment pins. These pins guide the booster during a chopstick lift right in the final few meters and help prevent Raptor denting, which was an issue on the earlier lifts. The removal of these pins has always been the sign that this booster won't leave the pad unless it's under the thrust of 33 Raptor engines. With us awaiting the rollout of Ship 33, which is still resting in the mega bay being prepared, we all wondered why it's taking so long. Well, we got an answer from the SpaceX website, which might just explain it. SpaceX has confirmed a lot of cool things in a recent mission page post on their website. While they haven't given a specific date yet, it highlights so many exciting and interesting upgrades that we want to go through them all and explain what they mean for the upcoming flight. SpaceX kicks off the statement by talking about Block 2 of Starship. Quote, the upcoming flight test will launch a new generation ship with significant upgrades, attempt Starship's first payload deployment test, fly multiple re-entry experiments geared towards ship catch and reuse, and launch and return the Super Heavy Booster. And yes, you read that right. First deployment test. More on that in a bit. They go on to detail the upgrades on Starship's upper stage. Quote, the vehicle's forward flaps have been reduced in size and shifted towards the vehicle tip and away from the heat shield, significantly reducing their exposure to re-entry heating while simplifying the underlying mechanisms and protective tiling. This is something we've seen on a few flights, where the hinges have been a major weak point for heat to get through to the body of Starship. With the move away from that heating, this should solve that problem. Lars Blackmore, one of the geniuses behind Falcon 9's landing ability and currently SpaceX's senior principal Mars landing engineer, spoke to the new forward flap design on X. Quote, this forward flap redesign consumed many months of my life. In theory, they're better on all metrics. Excited to see whether that holds in reality. SpaceX went on to say, quote, redesigns to the propulsion system, including a 25% increase in propellant volume, the vacuum jacketing of feed lines, a new fuel feed line system for the vehicle's Raptor vacuum engines, and an improved propulsion avionics module controlling vehicle valves and reading sensors all add additional vehicle performance and the ability to fly longer missions. There's a lot to unpack here. The 25% increase in propellant capacity comes with the increased size of the ship and the reduction in size of the payload space, but there's more. Vacuum jacketing of the feed lines means that some of the pipes feeding the Raptor engines are now insulated with a second pipe containing a vacuum. This likely reduces heat generation and, with that, helps the propellant stay cooler and reduces boil off. Overall, this helps to keep the propellants cooler for longer, which is useful if you're, say, about to embark on a nine-month journey to Mars. The improved propulsion avionics module seems to be some sort of controller that helps control the valves and steering of the system, and it's paired with upgrades on sensors. This helps SpaceX steer and guide the ship more efficiently and accurately. Quote, the ship's heat shield will also use the latest generation tiles and include a backup layer to protect from missing or damaged tiles. This is referencing the ablative layer we've seen in the past, where there's an additional layer below the tiles that will prevent burn through of the steel. In the next paragraph, SpaceX details that the avionics of the Block 2 ship have been completely redesigned to help with capability for redundancy for increasingly complex missions, such as the upcoming propellant transfer demo or a future ship catch. These upgrades include a more powerful flight computer, better antennas featuring Starlink, GNSS and RF connections, upgraded star tracking sensors, an updated power system and even more cameras. All combined, Starship is able to transmit over 120 20 megabits per second of real-time data to the engineers, giving them a much clearer understanding of the flight. That's faster than a lot of people's internet connections, including mine, so if anyone from Starlink is watching this, hit me up. I would love 120 megabits per second of upload speed as well. One of the most interesting things SpaceX said was, quote, while in space, Starship will deploy 10 Starlink simulators, similar in size and weight to the next generation Starlink satellites as the first exercise of a satellite deployment mission. The Starlink simulators will be on the same suborbital trajectory as Starship, with splashdown targeted in the Indian Ocean. A relight of a single Raptor engine while in space is also planned. 
It's confirmed, we're getting Starlink simulators to test the deployment mechanism. How cool is that? They won't stay in orbit and of course aren't functional Starlinks, but it's a step in the right direction. Starlink V3 will make a huge bandwidth upgrade to the Starlink network and because of their size, only Starship can launch them. If you want to learn more about the huge info dump SpaceX gave us on Starlink at the end of 2024, make sure to go and watch the latest episode of This Week in Spaceflight, NSF's weekly space news show. Back to Starship though, and the update continues. Quote, the flight test will include several experiments focused on ship return to launch site and catch. On Starship's upper stage, a significant number of tiles will be removed to stress test vulnerable areas across the vehicle. Multiple metallic tiling options, including one with active cooling, will test alternative materials for protecting Starship during re-entry. We've seen both these metal tiles and some of the other removed tiles that they've been talking about here, but it's always cool to see SpaceX go into detail about why they chose certain aspects of the design. And yes, apparently the active cooling, using some sort of gas or liquid to form a protective shield in front of the vehicle, isn't quite finished yet. SpaceX is testing the idea of active cooling on this flight again to see if it's a viable option, and they're also testing other materials that might turn out to be useful for Starship. The ship will also feature the catch fittings to measure the influence of aerodynamics with such fittings, since they obviously form some gaps in the design. And once again, SpaceX confirms that they're going for an extra spicy re-entry to test out the structural limits of this Block 2 Starship. So what about the booster? Well, first off, SpaceX confirms that the tower now features a set of radar sensors. Remember, on Flight 6, the catch wasn't performed because the tower and booster lost contact, so SpaceX is introducing an additional layer of redundancy to that system for this flight. The sensor that was damaged is also being extra protected before this flight. Furthermore, the booster will feature a reused engine. Yes, an engine that flew on Booster 12, the first and so far only Super Heavy booster to be recovered without exploding or sinking to the bottom of the ocean, has been installed on this booster. So this will be the first significant piece of hardware to actually be reused in the Starship program. Besides that, SpaceX confirmed once again that the very restrictive landing criteria are in place for this flight, and for a catch to be attempted, all automatic and manual checks need to be in place for the booster to be go for catch. This includes another manual go given by the flight director. Should this not be given, the booster will divert for a splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. No date has been officially set yet for this flight, but given air restrictions in Mexico, we know the current net date, that's no earlier than, is the 10th of the month, with additional backup windows all the way until the 16th. So we could be just days away from another big show in South Texas, potentially as soon as this Friday. Besides that, no road closures or other restrictions have been set yet, but we've seen these pop up relatively quickly in the past. To keep track when we're not making videos and not on the air, the next spaceflight website and app has this handy checklist, which is updated whenever new closures are put in place. The expectation is that if they're not going this week, a flight early next week seems pretty likely. And remember, the cadence is only going to get faster from here, so strap in. I've been Brian Caton for NSF, thanks for watching, and goodbye.